I wrote this function. Its name is me maybe, so that you can call me maybe. Hello guys, welcome to the second episode of the Redux Show. I'm Chris and I work as a software engineer at Palo IT and here with me today is Suri. Hello, I'm Suri. I do work as a software engineer at Palo IT. If you haven't followed us uh, from episode 1, the Redux Show is a podcast by Palo IT where we talk about the applications and products out there which makes our life easier by solving problems through the innovative solutions they provide. In the last episode, we had Noble and Tharindu who spoke about Netflix. The application that we'll be talking about today is from the company called Wise, or previously known as TransferWise. So without further ado, let's talk about it briefly together. So Suri, what's the problem that Wise tries to solve? All right, so I think uh, it's a pretty interesting product or an application to look at now because Wise primary uh, core activity is to provide money transfer service across the border. So the you, you can call it as international remittance. And uh, the the USP of the product is basically to provide the service uh-huh. at like nominal cost and your and your market rates also. Uh, if you're using uh, WISE, you get a really good exchange rate. Right, right. Yeah. From my understanding about uh, transferring money overseas or as you mentioned, remittance, I read that a traditional model of remittance, the transaction costs would come from various financial institutions who charge fees or like uh, commission, which then gets incurred by the sender of the transaction. Yep, exactly. I see. Okay, so what kind of model does WISE use in, in that case? Okay, so many of the modern transfer apps, right, like the international money transfer apps, they use uh, something called a P2P or a peer-to-peer, peer-to-peer model. So in which uh, there is, uh, whenever a transaction is made, okay. it tries to match a transfer in the reverse direction. I see. Yeah. What, what do you mean by like sending money or matching a transfer in the reverse direction? Okay, uh, in, in simpler terms, right, l- let's say someone is transferring money from uh, currency A to currency B. Okay. So the platform will look for transactions in the reverse direction. That is from currency B to currency A. So it will try to match the transfer and you, you you could transfer, the transfer could be made internally within the currencies. So by matching the inflows and outflows, they are able to provide the service at a very nominal cost to the customers. Oh, this this sounds really good since it provides cost savings uh, by leveraging these local transfers, right? Yeah. Uh, but are there any certain like uh, challenges faced when such a business model is used? Say, for example, um, what if the platform is not able to find the opposite uh, transaction for this purpose or not have like matching inflows and outflows? I mean, yeah, that is, that is a bigger problem, right? Like not every... Uh, currencies that you for which the transfers is being made, you will possibly not find a reverse reversal transfer in the in the reverse direction basically. So the inflows and outflows not necessarily match between two two currencies la. Mm-hmm. So I mean because the remittances vary with countries, right. but. Uh, to solve such problems, so, so from what I've read, right, so there are different ways. Uh, one of the simpler ways is to uh, just buy the currency from the market if, right. if you're not having that. Uh, or, you know, you could perform large tra- large scale currency trades. Okay. Uh, this, this is possible if you have like a huge huge volume of transactions uh-huh. and also a huge customer base. Now. I see. Yeah. Oh, that that truly makes a strong value proposition and a win-win situation for the for them and the users. Okay. So, I mean, coming back to the different models of sending money, I understand that the SWIFT or like the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunication is one of the older typical ways of uh, remittance for for many years. Okay. How does uh, SWIFT compare with uh, the P two P model that you mentioned? Okay, in SWIFT, right, uh, so it's it's like a consortium of banks okay. who work together. So they have a common network. So whenever a transfer is made through SWIFT, it goes through the different banks in the network to reach the destination bank, la, bank or the person. I yeah. see. Yeah. 
Does, does this mean that each member bank of this uh, consortium provides the service of handling the transfers across borders? Yeah, that is that is that is correct because okay. uh, when you like. Um, so to understand this right we'll, we'll discuss something called an exchange rate margin okay. so this is this exchange rate margin is basically what is the margin on top of the current exchange rate mm-hmm. which the customers actually are paying so the difference between the market rate and the exchange and the exchange rate that you get right. so in this case right since not to cover the cost through the banks that it goes through and also through the other operational cost because it goes through different banks so this so there is this exchange rate needs to be will definitely be higher in I case see. Do. okay yeah. that makes p2e model actually way efficient since there's less uh, operational mm-hmm. and financial costs in in the whole remittance process right yeah that is true so this allows uh, companies to provide other services like money transfer wallets okay. and then uh, uh multi currency accounts etc i see yeah okay okay so we spoke a lot about uh, business stuff and uh, the business model so if we were to reverse engineer this or build a system which supports this business model what do you think could be one of the ways to construct the architecture on a on a just a high level yeah so since we are like following this sort of peer to peer model right so uh, sending sending um, sending amount is is a different event and you know receiving the amount is a different event and it could be other consumers of the event la so mm-hmm. basically the money sending process for the money sending process so i think it would suit a money event driven architecture mm-hmm. this case where okay. different microservices are interacting with each other and uh, they they consume the events la basically I see. so the challenge is basically to identify what are all the business functions within within this product that we are building right okay. uh, so on top of your head like can you think of some some of the business use cases mm, here i mean for me in my opinion i think once the transfer is initiated yeah. there has to be user authentication uh, the balance checks the calculating of the fees uh, the the transfer fees and stuff uh, compliance checks and then finally the payment fulfillment uh, which in itself could have multiple um, sub domains that actually trigger the workflows new workflows which which is true so in the sense like uh let's let's say we are building this app on okay. prem then right. i uh, i mean if you have the right resources la but let's say we are taking a cloud for an example right mm-hmm. uh, so we choose aws or something okay. so we could build an app we build a web app which actually receives the request synchronously right. i mean you do the wafs and the gateways and stuff correctly so okay. the requests are synchronously received and uh, once you receive the request these uh, request are the state of the request is state stored in some database la right. of your choice and you could use uh, patterns like event sourcing mm-hmm. or change data capture to actually push these events to a message broker or an event broker so we can actually have multiple consumers to this event bridge uh, and we look for the data to complete the required business function Uh, yeah that's that's exactly I see, correct. I see. Yeah. so like there could be some lambda function yeah. doing uh, balance validations or uh, ecs tasks being triggered uh, for validating or flagging out the fraudulent transactions yeah that's right that's i right. see yeah. okay then what would uh, how would the payment flow uh, payment fulfillment flow look like okay the payment fulfillment is a complex workflow so okay. we need to we need to keep the business users you know closer to the payment uh, fulfillment because it could be changing and could be different for different countries also right. okay. and different types of payments so we could have an, uh, a workflow engine maybe a comunda or uh, you know you can use step functions also if you're using aws and all okay. so what happens is like once once there's an event mm-hmm. so the event the consumer receives this event yeah. so in order to fulfill that first it'll do the validations mm-hmm. uh, what type of transfers being made is it uh, i mean there are different types of transfers net mm-hmm. RTGS, ACH, right. etc. So it it does that sort of validations and also the country specific validations. Mm. So once all this is done and like completed, right? So we we actually reach the fulfillment part where we actually uh, complete the transfer. So mm-hmm. it it needs to go through uh, the authentication authorization, right? So yeah. so the banks and uh, the payment partners need to authorize us. So okay. once it's authorized, the payment. is completed okay. and the state is updated la to the customer right to then yeah this would be like a full flow mm, yeah. interesting so if i were to summarize uh, what you just mentioned am i right to say that there are country specific checks um 
to be done by like uh, the the reg- as in laid out by the regulatory authority. Say for example in Singapore, like the MAS, right? Yep. yep. Monetary Authority of Singapore. Mm-hmm. So they do these checks first, uh, pertaining to the amount of money transferred, and then once that's done. Uh, these transfers can then be fulfilled by the different payment modes. Yep, exactly. Right, okay. Yeah. Actually, come to think of it, we may need to build other services for identifying anomalies and reporting to regulatory authorities, um, like other analytics, reversals of uh, transactions, etc. Uh, exactly, but, okay. the, but the core will still remain the events, la, which, which, which is being sent by the user, right? right. So it's necessary to build the... Um, scalable uh, event broker okay. to ha- to handle the events mm-hmm. and you know make sure they are consumers of the event are item put in so they they handle the duplicates correctly ah, so that's, that's that's the most uh, challenging part right. thing that's true that's true yeah i i'm sure we have message brokers which are quite scalable um and good and with good support like uh, rabbit mq active mq uh, apache kafka yeah, that's right. Even AWS provides a uh, managed Kafka service for this. La. So we discuss a lot about uh, money transfer services. Uh, and then how do other features like uh, the wallet services uh, work? Uh, okay. <laughs> the wallet is a huge topic in itself. Like we need to, uh, because the regulatories will be quite different for wallet services because it, it needs the approvals of different regulatory authorities how how do you store the data right to store the, because it's a it's basically people's money uh, so i guess it's a huge topic for another day okay <laughs> all right okay thanks for a really good discussion on how to reverse engineer a product like uh, wise and what we can possibly consider for the high level architecture Anyway, we have uh, come to the end of episode 2 of our podcast and we hope that you've learned something new, uh, something valuable from this sharing. We hope to see you again in episode 3. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.